Vishnu Badaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Shamini Tinamane Namaste Sarasati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvisesa Sanyavari Paschachere Satarine Sri Krishna Chaitana Prabhunitananda Sri Advaita Gadadhara Shiva Sri Gaurabhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Today we're going to talk about what women can do and can't do. in the Hare Krishna movement. Or maybe we can also talk about what they're supposed to do and not supposed to do. But before we start, does anyone have any questions? Why so much pressure on women in, in our society, in our movement? Pressure in which way? Uh, and behavior way. What should she should do, not oh. the man should do. Oh, okay. So you're saying in our movement there's more pressure On about how women should behave than men? Men yeah. can do anything? Yeah, yeah. But women... Everything depends on her and she... She can mess everything up? She's responsible for everything going on in her family. Or it's a specific question in uh, most Russian. <laughs> it's because Is it specific to Russia? In Ukraine, yeah. That there's pressure on women? Yeah. To, and if they don't do things right, then it, it creates a problem for others? Is that the yeah, like in Vedic culture, everything depends on women, not on uh, men behavior. But it's the way how they preach in uh, Russia, Ukraine. And all the women always in shock, right? So they try to pull them down. Give a practical example. I am practical example. <laughs> I am victim of that preaching. <laughs> no, practically what? What is it? Practical. Practically, like, yeah. you have to do this. Yes. Why? Yeah, so what you're saying is it seems like... I can explain. Like, I came here, I was married and divorced, but... When I was married, I thought like everything depends on me. I should tolerate everything because uh, because of my tolerance. After a while, he will change his behavior. Okay. He will notice that I'm actually the good, you know. But it's weird. So, in other words, tolerate. if something doesn't go right, they blame it on the women. Yeah. Ninety-nine points. Is that right? Yeah. And then, what do the women think? First, they listen and try to understand them, and, but later they face up with the things that it's not actually correlated with that idea. So then the women find out it's not all their fault. And, yeah. and it's not work. And it's not going to work when you always turn Oh, it's not going to work if you try to blame someone who's not at fault. Okay. So the question is then, what do you do about it? As women? Is it same here or it's on a specific is it that region? Is that everywhere? Okay. Everywhere. Is it, the question is, is it everywhere? Is it everywhere? Is it right? <coughs> is it right? And uh, what is right? And if that's not right, what is right? Yeah. Is that, a, is that okay? Anyone want to add anything to the question? Um, Your point? Uh, why in our... 
person of how saintly women behave, and then she, what she has to do, tolerance everything, don't tell, don't tell anyone. Uh -huh. and, uh, if you're a saintly woman, you should tolerate everything and don't complain. Yes. Okay. And then you will gain the bliss and your family will... And then if you do that, in your next life you become a man. <laughs> That's the reward. And uh, some preachers <laughs> even say that woman couldn't come back to the spiritual sky until she is so fully surrendered to her uh, husband. Yeah. All right. You can't go back to Godhead without unless you surrender to your husband. Yeah, and if you're not married. What if he's not going back to Godhead? <laughs> then what happens? By you, by your devotion, can go back to Godhead. He can go, might not go, but if you surrender and because of that, you will go. Like well, generally it's said, if a, whoever you serve, you get the benefit of their service. Yeah. So you serve a husband, and he's going back to Godhead, and you benefit. Just like you serve a guru, you benefit. So... This is an interesting question. I don't know if everywhere in the world women have this problem. But, um, because, uh, you know, uh, now, now uh, more, mostly speak about their equality. And then our Shastras, you have to oblige. And yeah. only so she's equality. saying in the, in, in the modern world we speak of equality. Yes. In our Shastras we speak of inequality. Well, I don't, inequality is not a good word. We speak of Subordination, dominant role and subordinate role. Okay, here's the problem. It's very simple. If your husband or your authority is pure, gentle, kind, empathetic, compassionate, you have no problem submitting. Correct? Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, whatever. You have, you have a list of qualities that um, if the qualities are there sufficiently, if there's enough qualities and they're deep enough, then it's very easy to be subordinate because you're happy, you get what you want, you're not exploited, you're taken care of. Is that correct? Yes? Yeah? She hasn't seen that man, so she's having trouble agreeing. But if that man existed, yeah, okay. So, so when when Shastra says woman should be subordinate, just like when it says you should surrender to your guru, it's not any guy on the street becomes your guru and abuses you, and he says, "Give me all your money." serve me 20 hours a day and you do that and he's a bum so obviously there's qualification and when there's qualification naturally you want to serve because you want to reciprocate with what you're being given that's natural psychology correct yeah so then it said the husband's supposed to be like the guru so if the husband has those qualities then you don't even have to say submit because if he's so He's so um, empathetic of your needs, and he's so wise, naturally. It's very easy to have a relationship with him because he's always trying to help you. And especially if he's very wise, then when he gives you instruction, it'll be helpful and it'll be natural to do it. And if he's very compassionate, you can talk to him and discuss. If you don't like something, you tell him, and he doesn't get upset. Right? The in theory. Yeah, in theory. If, if that's the kind of husband, then all those qualities would naturally come. Because what Shastra is saying, in a natural environment, woman would rather be in that position, to not have to fight for themselves, but to be taken care of. But when a man demands that, but is not qualified, then you don't want to do that, and then you look at the Shastra and say, 
why is the Shastra telling me to do all these things? And when I have a man who's not qualified to do those things for, forcing me to be that way. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's, that's the problem. Anybody not understand? Raise your hand if you don't understand. So, you can apply this to so many things. In the Vedas, it says, you should respect your mother and father. Yes? yes. You should respect your elder brother, elder sister. And what if your mo mother and father says, go to McDonald's and get me a hamburger? Do you respect that instruction? No. You can't. Because it's not a respectable instruction. So because they give you an instruction you shouldn't respect, you don't do what the Shastra says and respect your mother and father by following those instructions because they're not respectable. In our Shastra, I just read it yesterday and I don't know where it is, maybe in the seventh canto, Prabhupada says, a woman is not obliged to serve a husband who is, I don't know the words Prabhupada used, but not qualified, maybe fallen. fallen. So in our sense of fallen, someone who's not following Krishna consciousness, if the marriage is in Krishna consciousness, the husband's not following Krishna consciousness, she can follow him, but dharmically she's not obliged to follow him. So you have a husband who's not following, and then he's asking you to not follow with him, you're not obliged to follow that. But what is the case if he is not, how to say, intelligent enough to understand her needs and to do proper decision with some property and money? Yeah. And he says, give me your money, give me your property, and he can spend it just... Yeah, okay. She's days. asking, what if, what if your husband is not expert in managing certain affairs in the home and he wants to manage them. Those are really the questions you ask before you get married. Those are the things you, do, you try to find out before you get married and discuss. After you get married it's harder. But what if we discuss some points before marriage and then he's not following? Yeah. And then we already married him. Hmm. So I have to divorce or what to do. But in Shastras you should According to Shastras, you should divorce. Mm -hmm. You should have only one husband for your life. And if you divorce, you just better burn yourself and pay fire. <laughs> and, uh, well, uh, it's one thing. Shave your head and wear uh, white cloth and better die. <laughs> well, that is dying, basically. Um, if a situation, I mean, what you described is not something you couldn't work out. But if you couldn't work it out and it was going to rob you of all your savings and he was going to misspend it and it jeopardized your family, you could consider it um, a, a situation which isn't secure and you may need to separate. But ideally, if, something, if the situation gets that bad, then Prabhupada said separate but don't get married again. But that's not even practical for everybody. Um, every situation is going to be different. Obviously, you want to try to work it out. Um, we just had a meeting today with about 25 senyas candidates. And I was hired for no pay, but I was hired to speak to the sannyasis about how do you preach to grihastas. First thing I said is don't. Unless you're qualified. So I told them a lot of things about Grihastha life they didn't know, which was kind of interesting. For them, it was interesting. Your question, it's very common. What do you do if, and there's many ifs, different scenarios. 
And the best answer I can give is you. When you marry an ISKCON, there's one thing you have to understand. The man you're marrying has been brainwashed a little bit. You agree? Yeah, that's the problem. So you have to find someone who's less brainwashed. How many of you women agree? Raise your hand if you agree. It's the brainwashing is, as Leela Shakti said, the brainwashing is basically the man can do no wrong. And whatever's wrong, it's the woman's fault, and the woman just has to do what the man says. Right? More or less? Is that? So that's how they've been trained. So I was telling the sannyasis, potential sannyasis, I said, do you realize that many divorces in our movement are byproducts of Bhagavatam classes that, that teach things that make men think like they can't do anything wrong? So you have to understand that your husband may be a very nice person, very reasonable, compassionate, sympathetic, but he's heard a lot of classes that kind of make him think that the pressure is on you. So if you can help him get some education to balance it out, that would help. To hear other kinds of classes, speak to other kinds of devotees, speak to grihastas, to make him understand that he has his part to play also. Because really, it doesn't make any sense to say that everything depends on one person. Because that's not how the world is, is it? No, it's never like that. My, my instruction is to anyone who's having a bad relationship, my instruction is to always realize you're in the relationship. So you must have something to do with it. Yes? In every bad relationship you ever had, you were in it. In every argument you ever had, you were in it. So you must have something to do with it. Yes? Something. Maybe not a lot, but something. Or you could do something to maybe prevent it, or neutralize it, or make it better. Yes? Maybe? Possible? So I think that's common sense. So if a man is denying, or a woman is denying their responsibility in a relationship that isn't working, that just goes against the way the world works. Yes? Maybe he doesn't trust you with money. Maybe he wants to use my money for his own yeah. sense gratification. Or Maybe. Then you should have the money in your name. <clears throat> yes, but in Shastras it says that woman, woman shouldn't earn any money. She is just dependable as a child. Okay. Um, then you have to apply Shastra to the practical realities. If your husband's going to waste all your money buying motorcycles, and you know that, then, and you need the money for your children's education, then you might do something like, say, it's my money. And but he says, you're not uh, surrender to me. I have to manage your... Yeah. And you say, yeah, I'm not surrendered because I know you're going to buy motorcycles. You see, so you have to understand that man has been programmed to think you have to do whatever he says. So there was, a, um, there was one devotee that read in Prabhupada's books that woman should do whatever the husband says. So he went to Prabhupada and asked this important question. And you can relate this story to your husband. Srila Prabhupada, should the wife do whatever the husband says? What do you think Prabhupada said? No. What do you think? <laughs> this answer could startle the Russian continent. Prabhupada used the word, I'm... I'm losing my memory. 
I can't remember the word, but he said to the effect, I think he used the word audacious. You know audacious, what audacious means? In other words, you and you should be so proud and crazy to think that your wife's supposed to do whatever you say. That was his answer. So it says in the book, the wife should be submissive to the husband. Right? It doesn't, that doesn't mean because she's submissive, now he can tell her anything and she has to do it. That's his misunderstanding. Her being submissive and him telling her whatever are two different things. The instruction for her to be submissive is for her, it's not for him. You see the problem? You understand the problem? That instruction is for you, it's not for him. If he takes the instruction for the woman to think that that gives me a right to force her to do whatever I say, he's misunderstood the instruction. Because again, she will do whatever he says if he's a good husband. It's natural. And she's happy to do that. It's natural if he's a good husband. That's where the problem is. When a man reads a Bhagavatam and it describes the duties of a woman, are those duties for him or for the woman? Who are they for? Yeah, but now when it describes the duties of a woman, why does he have to know the duties of a woman? He has to know the duties of a man. Like, there are duties. <laughs> yeah, the husband should be husband. Okay, let's say the husband should be Krishna conscious. That's definitely there. Don't become a father unless you can deliver your family. Should guide the children to be Krishna conscious, right? But um, there's some obvious things a husband should do. But the point is, the shastra does describe activities for a husband. And those instructions are for the man, and the instructions for the women are for the women. These are the duties of the woman. When the man thinks the instructions for the women are meant for him to enforce those on the women, that creates a problem. You get a job, we tell you what to do. Those instructions are for you. They're not for the person next to you. Then you see the person next to you is not doing what they told you to do, and you get upset. Why aren't you doing what I'm supposed to do? No, those instructions are for you. They're not for... So those instructions are for you. They're not for him. And when he thinks they're for him, and he thinks he has the right to enforce them on you, then that creates a problem. You agree? And if it creates a problem, it can't be what Krishna wants. Could it? If you put two people together and they're not Krishna conscious, and the reason they're not Krishna conscious is they're perfectly following the Shastra. Does that make sense? Should I say that again? Yes. You have a man and a woman who apparently are perfectly following Shastra, and they're perfectly miserable. Does it make sense? No. <laughs> it doesn't. So you have people arguing on the basis of Shastra who both don't know how to get along, who have a horrible marriage, and they're saying, we're just trying to enforce the Shastra on the marriage, and the whole thing breaks apart. That doesn't make any sense, does it? But what about maybe if they are not compatible? And what if they are, and they misunderstand Shastra? That we can... What? But, that's the problem we can... but even incompatible people can get along. And even compatible people may not get along. Yes. That's possible. Why compatible can? Why compatible can? Cannot? Yeah. Because they're immature and they uh, read the shastra and become 
you know, you do what I say or move out. Because that's what the Shastra says. No, it doesn't say that, but you think it says that, and then it creates a problem. So, does it mean that tolerance and humbleness are not works? Does it mean that tolerance and humbleness don't work? Sometimes they don't. Because you're tolerating and being humble with someone that you shouldn't tolerate and be humble with. It's like Prabhupada said, if somebody comes to harm a devotee, then the devotee next to him will stand up and protect the devotee. And Prabhupada said, no more trinata pi sunichena. Now you defend him. So sometimes there's a time to give up humbleness and tolerance because it's going to have a bad effect. Anyone ever tell you that? Yeah. Well, does it make sense? Yeah. It's not me. That's what Prabhupada said. Those were his words. Forget Trinata Pisuni Chena. Now you defend this devotee. No more humility. Defend them. There's a time to give up that kind of humility and that kind of tolerance. You don't tolerate it. Is that okay? Well, this is a good lead-in to the topic because well, there's many things you can understand from this. But the point I wanted to make was that if something is not working and you think it's shastric, that means you've misunderstood the shastra. Because if you're following the Shastra, it would work. Right? Yes? We, or our Shastras are wrong. One of the two. I couldn't follow it completely, you know? Like in Vedic society, parents find a husband for you, and like this. And you live in Vedic village where everywhere, everyone can help you if you need yeah. some help. They can instruct your husband. And well, to follow, to okay, that's all right. But just now, between two people... What's not possible? What's not possible? Because we are not living in a big family. We just right. live two of us or three of us separate. So families. what's not possible? No possible to create a Vedic marriage. What's a Vedic marriage? That means that you have a big family with your father and yeah. mother. Yeah. We just we don't we just want to create Krishna consciousness. That's all we care about. Right? We want to become lovers of Krishna. That's what we want to create. Forget the Vedic, big family, village. That's nice if you have it, but the main thing is we want to create Krishna consciousness. How do you create Krishna consciousness between two people? To read Shastras together, to do some activity together. Yeah. And to be nice to one another. And not steal somebody's money. And buy motorcycles, or whatever he wants to buy. <laughs> now he's going to come beat me up, right? when he sees the video. <laughs> what? Um. He will not come. He has another wife. Oh, okay. No problem. Um, your problems are solved now? No. I, I think maybe I have to save my head and mm. wait. Uh, wear white and better burn myself instead of doing to marry no. someone else. <laughs> because um, when he left he gave so much feeling of guilt if yeah. he okay this is very good this is what I want to talk about this is a very good point the original question that Leela Shakti asked was it seems like everything's dependent on the woman and if they don't act properly then they're made to feel bad and here is an example of that that now she's been made to feel so bad that she actually believes she's bad. And that's the problem. I was talking today to one devotee who is a co-minister for the woman's, for the Vaishnavi ministry. So I said, this is the topic, what women can and can't do. So, what do you have to say? And she said, well, in Iskon, Sometimes women are told they can't do certain things that they can actually do. 
And sometimes they use that as an excuse not to try because they've been told they can't, when they actually know they can. And that's a problem, and I've seen that problem. So if I say, you're bad, you created a problem, it's your fault, and then you think, okay, well that's a good excuse for just failing, because I've been told that actually I'm, no, I'm not good anyway. That becomes a problem for you. You understand? Yeah. So I think many women in our movement have gone through that a little bit or a lot. To, you know, to say, well, men are better, women are worse. Then you can say, okay, well, I'm not really expected to be Krishna conscious because men are more Krishna conscious, women are weaker. So it's okay if I'm not Krishna conscious. Then this was what she said. And she said, and then we can use that as a rationale for not trying. Does that make sense? Yes? And the mistake that the women make is if someone says you're less, you're less intelligent, you're less this, you're less that, you're less capable here and there. <clears throat> the mistake you make is you, you believe that and then that's how you start acting. If you think you're less intelligent, how will you act? Or how do you have to act? Less intelligent. Because that will confirm that you're less intelligent. And when we say women are less intelligent, we, we're not talking about IQ. Do you understand? Do you know that? It's not IQ. It has nothing to do with your material capabilities in general. Although your minds may be wired differently. You might be better with language than engineering. But... Um, Strictly speaking, we're not talking about that kind of intelligence. You know, you ever heard this story? Prabhupada learned from his professor in psychology what they believed to be true in 1918 or whenever it was, that the size of the brain determined the level of intelligence. So if you had a bigger brain, you had more intelligence. If you had a smaller brain, you had smaller intelligence. That's what they believed. I don't know why. I don't know the research. Then I found out Marilyn Monroe had like 54-ounce brain and Albert Einstein had like 32 or something. You know, it wasn't corroborated. It wasn't... Anyway, so Prabhupada used to say that this was what I've learned in school and sometimes I used to quote that. And then and then they had asked Prabhupada, well, what about the women who are devotees? Do they have 32 ounce? And Prabhupada said, no, when they become devotees it becomes 64 ounce. So he was just kind of joking. Like, you come a devotee your brain will grow. So what was his point? His point was, well, if you become a devotee, then you're amongst the most intelligent people, right? And if you don't become a devotee, you're amongst the least intelligent. You agree? Is that true? Yes? No? Raise your hand if you think you're among the most intelligent. Keep them, keep them raised, I want to count. Okay, raise your hand if you don't think you're amongst the most intelligent. Yeah, let's see. So, these three have been thoroughly brainwashed <laughs> by, by that propaganda that you're less intelligent. Okay, so how about this? You have heart disease and you need an operation. Hare Krishna. You have heart disease and you need an operation. And you have two choices, a female surgeon or a male butcher. <laughs> now, we all know men are more intelligent than women, so obviously we'll take the male butcher over the female doctor, correct? <laughs> How many take the male butcher for the triple bypass surgery? How many take the female doctor? Why would you take the female? We all know females less intelligent. Yeah. Yes?
So what the men have to learn is that when Shastra is saying women are less intelligent, it's not IQ intelligence. It's not skills and capabilities. It's nature. By nature, in general, women are more attached to the body. Yes? To the home, to those comforts, than the men. Right? These guys can wear the same dhoti and kurta for the next 25 years. They're fine. They can sleep on a mat on the floor for the rest of their life, and they're fine. You can't do that. Different nature. Yes? Yeah? <laughs> no, it means you won't do it anyway, so you don't have to ask the question. <laughs> it means it would be artificial for you. That's what it means. Yeah. Yeah, well, okay, and that's another point. Some men have more feminine qualities and some women have more male qualities. So some women don't care that much how they dress. Some men care a lot about how they dress. Right? Yes? Sometimes. But percentage-wise, more women care how they dress than men. Especially in our movement. Right? So, um, so, for the men, you understand, less intelligent means there's more um, there's more um, physical attachment to the body in general. It's easier for men to do austerity in general. Have you noticed that? It's not that women can't be more austere, but in general. It may be a little easier. Men are a little more, less concerned about these things. But it doesn't mean material capabilities are less. So the mistake the men will make is to make the women feel less capable. Because if you make someone feel less capable, they'll act less capable. Right? So I know some women will say, I was very confident until I came to ISKCON and I lost some of my confidence because I was made to feel less capable. Yes. Anyone have that experience? Oh, yeah. I see that all the time. Yeah. So that, that is a disservice that the men would do, or maybe a disservice the women would do to the women also, if the women tell other women, you're less capable. There's a um, principle in psychology that if you think of yourself in a certain way, you, you will act that way. So just like Prabhupada, he always made us think we could do more than we thought we could do. So we did more because he made us think we could do more. He never made us feel like, oh, you're stupid, you can't do anything. He was just the opposite. That one of the times Prabhupada came to New York and he said, I want all of you to start temples. So one of the women raised her hand and said, you want the women to start temples also? He said, yes. That never happened, but Anyway, he wasn't opposed to it, so he wasn't, he wasn't making them feel unqualified. So then there was a morning walk, I told this story, there was a morning walk, and so um, there's a one sannyasi on the morning walk, and he was saying, Prabhupada, isn't it true that the cause of entanglement in the world is women? And Prabhupada was silent. They continue walking. Isn't it true, Prabhupada, the cause, the attachment to woman is the cause of material bondage? Prabhupada didn't say anything. Again, he asks, you know, a few minutes later. Finally, Prabhupada says, Yes. He's like, not talk about it, just yes. Then they get back to the temple, and in the temple are four women greeting Prabhupada. They pay obeisances to Prabhupada. And Prabhupada said, and this was after they had that conversation, that women's the cause of attachment. And he said, he said, 
But if you associate with these women, you'll go back to Godhead, right? So for every like negative statement, then there's the positive statement. You understand? So like you have to understand a statement and complete. Another example, and this shows how Prabhupada was not stereotyped. You understand? Stereotyped? Like sometimes we make a statement. It's a general statement. So it generally applies, but specifically it may not apply to everybody. So Prabhupada, he may make general statements, but then specifically he may make other statements which don't always apply in every situation. Right? Women can give classes if they know the philosophy. If the man knows better, he gives. If she knows better, she gives. General statement, no, only men should give class. Men are smarter. They know philosophy better. Is that true in every situation? Not necessarily always. Hmm. So, what do you do if you have a marriage and the wife is very Krishna conscious and the husband is not very Krishna conscious? What do you do then? A white man. What? A white man. No, you're already married. You're already married and your wife is more Krishna conscious. You should push her down till you feel comfortable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what it happens? Definitely, if you're a man, you should pull her down so she submits to you. Um, so this question actually came to Prabhupada. Krihasta man said, my wife is actually more Krishna conscious than I am. So the general relationship is wife follows the husband, the husband is Krishna conscious, he guides the wife. That's the idea. Prabhupada turned it around. He said, well, if your wife is more Krishna conscious, then you should follow her. So that's an example of not being stereotyped. Now all the women are going to go home today and tell their husbands, you know, I'm more Krishna conscious than you, so you should follow me. Right? And that's, they'll say, well, what did you learn from class today? Well, I learned that you should follow me because I'm more Krishna conscious. Now, that would seem to completely turn upside down everything in Shastra, right? That the wife should guide the husband. Whoop. And Prabhupada said that, so it's a good thing I'm not the one who said it. I'm just quoting Prabhupada because if I said it, I might be ostracized, right? Or maybe have my neck cut off or just pulled off the seat and put a new speaker here. But Prabhupada said that. So, um, what do we understand? One of the things we understand is Prabhupada was practical. So, whatever works to make you Krishna conscious, right? Okay, let's say you have a situation, two devotees, one superior, one inferior. They're trying to work something out. Does it mean that the superior should give instruction to the junior and the junior should follow? In, some, in general, you say yes. But if the superior knows the junior is not going to follow, or the superior knows that the junior is smarter than he is in this particular area, then he might say, what do you think we should do? And the junior says, I think we should do this. And the superior says, okay, let's do that. Does that ever happen? Sometimes, no. Maybe. <laughs> Depends what country. But sometimes it has to happen that way. So... You're an engineer, we have to build a temple. I'm not an engineer. I ask you, what should we do? It's not that I tell you what to do because I'm an older devotee. You have to tell me what to do because you know. Right? That's practical. Yes? It's okay? Yeah. So you can't read Shastra and then make it impractical. Right? Then you get problems. And that was my point to you. Oh, we follow Shastra perfectly and we have a horrible relationship. How did you end up with a horrible relationship by following Shastra? It doesn't make sense. That means, it must mean you didn't understand what was in the Shastra. You think you're following it, but you're not. 
is, if all, are all the instructions in Shastra aimed to create bad relationships and unhappy people? Of course not. And if that's the result, I must not be following something. So, you're lying on your deathbed and the Yamadutas come and you say, Why did you come? Why are you coming for me? He said, Oh, because you mistreated devotees. And you say, but I just followed the Shastra. You could, you know, that wouldn't make any sense, would it? So the men have to understand that to tell somebody you're less, you're lower, you're unintelligent, means even if they're not, if they hear it enough, they'll start believing it and then they'll start acting like that. So then we've just disempowered like 50% of the movement or maybe now it's more than 50, I don't know. In Russia, what percentage are women? 300%? More than men? Yeah. So then you're disempowering more than half the movement by doing that. Because if you tell somebody there's something wrong with them, they'll start believing it. You know that story? There was this group of friends and they said, well, let's play a joke on our friend. So that every day our friend walks down this road. So we'll line up every hundred yards on the road. And when the friend comes, we'll tell him, you become a ghost. You become a ghost. And says, what are you talking about? Oh, you become a ghost. He walks a hundred yards down. The next friend says, Oh my God, you become a ghost. He walks a hundred yards. The next friend says, Oh, you become a ghost. After the third or fourth, he starts believing it. So, if, if we keep telling people you're this or that and therefore you're disqualified, after a while they're going to start believing it, then they're going to start acting that way. Because whatever you believe about yourself is how you act. Did you know that? Just like if I say, Leela Shakti, you are amazingly talented. You're such a good artist, you're such a good this and that. And Leela Shakti says, no I'm not, I'm not really that good. No, no you are. And every day I see her, I tell her, you realize how good you are? She's, after about the fifth day, she'll probably start thinking, well, maybe I'm better than I thought. And the work she does is going to come out better because I got her to think that she's better than she thinks she is. Does that make sense? That's what Prabhupada did with us. He encouraged us that we're better, you know, we can do more than we thought. So that's a great service to someone, to encourage them, you're very good, you're very capable, you're very intelligent, whatever it is, because then they'll start acting that way. Oh, I couldn't distribute this, this many books. No, you can. I couldn't open a temple. No, you can. You're, quali you're capable, you can do it. I know you can do it. That's what Prabhupada did to us. You had a question? Yeah. And sometimes we do not want to believe that. Well, we don't want to believe it. <laughs> He's saying, if someone says you're smart and you don't want to believe it, no. and uh, you read... Uh, you, 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 you do not have any qualities, you cannot do this. Mm. Where we feel, no, I, cannot do, I can do this. You have to put trust and give me some power to do this. Then the uh, will to prove I can do this. And it becomes stronger and stronger and then... Oh, out of false ego, you want to rebel? Maybe. Yeah. But generally with women, they don't act that way. That's more male ego. The women just go, okay. They'll just perform badly because they were told that they're not that good. Yeah, the man may revolt. No, I'll show you how good I am. Right? It's more male psychology.
that true? You agree? You agree? Yes. Okay. Tell me. My Yeah, sometimes it happens with the man when you give uh, glorifying him, he became proud and start acting in very uh, proud way. What do you think about it? Acting in a proud way, yeah. What do I think? I think either. You said the wrong thing, or that person is very immature. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So with immature people, that yeah, you want to immature people, yes, you deal with them differently. Like he said, you chastise them. <laughs> That's the language immature people understand. You are, you are nothing. And if you someday become humble, Krishna can use you. Otherwise, you'll do nothing. That's the language they understand, right? Yes. Well, there's two kinds of maturity. One is spiritual and one is material. So what we're referring to with his question is um, mostly material immaturity, which does affect spiritual maturity. Uh -huh. What is spiritual maturity? It's, it's, um, if you look at the level of material attachment that a person has, the level of desire to enjoy the world a person has or doesn't have, that's how you can evaluate their spiritual maturity. So, like she's saying, Maybe she's very Krishna conscious, and the husband, he just comes home and watches television. <coughs> and chances rounds while he's watching television. Show himself and what do you mean? You can see him or he reveal gives you realization. 
этот, на этот есть вопрос Бахтисидата Сарасвати Цукур, он дает определение откровения, что является откровением. Он говорит, что откровением является видение одного из аспектов Абсолюта, которое по своей эмоциональной яркости и силе превосходит все материальные чувства. И дается Господом как э, э, помощь в его стремлении к нему. Вы сможете ответить? Попробую, давайте читать. Бхактисиданта Сарасвати Кукур says that revelation is... Что такое? Дает определение. Конкретно да, это понятно. Да. И говорит, что видение одного из аспектов Абсолюта... Is, is when we can see one of Absolute's aspects and it overcomes all the material feelings. Yeah, that's a, um, what you're talking about are different stages of devotional service. Different, we're talking about different stages. So you'd have to ask the question, like, what's the sign of advancement on this stage? What's the sign on this stage, this stage? Because you may be on this stage, and you're talking about advancement on this stage. So then it's not practical, because you won't be on this stage. So for this stage, we have to understand. So I was asking your question on this stage. The stage of Baba, you can see Krishna. So that on the stage of you're describing Baba and Prema. Yeah, obviously Baba and Prema is advancement. But what about us right now? How do we understand? That uh, Shiva Prabhupada didn't mention that it's on Bhava and Prema level. He just gave the answer to the question like. Oh, Bhakti Siddhanta or Prabhupada? No, it's it. Uh, he mentioned that in Nivya seventy four in Melbourne, somebody asked a question, and the answer of Shiva Prabhupada was like that. That Shiva Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati gave this detail. Yeah, answer. I'm just elaborating on the answer. That's because he's asked, he's answering the question by stating what is love of God. Revelation means realization. Realization or seeing Krishna? Real, revelation and seeing Krishna are two different things. So yes, definitely, revelation is a sign of advancement. But that's not the only sign. Because we were talking about the man is here and the woman is here. So I was just saying, he's much more materially attached than she is. And if you're more materially detached, you'll have more revel revelation, for sure. But not till you get to Bhava or Prema will you see Krishna. That revelation's different. So then for us, what's how do we monitor our advancement? And Prabhupada said, detachment. Of seeing Krishna, yes. But other revelation? Yeah. Seeing Krishna, yes. What's their level of realization? What's their level of advancement? They can't because they think they are Krishna. Mm -hmm. 
Сейчас я помню. Нет, сейчас прописываю утверждение. Ладно, все, я снимаю. Это надо дело. Talking about Brahman or Mayavadi? About Mayavadi is how they uh, are reaching out for Brahman. So yeah. this is how like... What, and what about them? How do they see Krishna? Yeah, like in the form of Brahman. But they think they are Krishna. So how are they going to see Krishna if they think they are Krishna? There is no Krishna. We're all Krishna. Well, how am I going to see Krishna? I am Krishna. You are Krishna. I'm seeing Krishna. I see you. You're Krishna. You see me. I'm Krishna. Om Namo Narayana. That's how they offer obeisances to one another. Om Namo Narayana. So, Hare Krishna. Yes. <coughs> Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, how, how can leaders and juniors become mature? Just associate with mature people so you understand if you're mature or not. Um, a lot of times you understand something in a very narrow way. So you associate with someone who understands it in a broader way, or a broader way, or a broader way. That would be spiritually mature understanding. Or materially, same thing. But materially immature means you don't control your emotions. You act like a little boy instead of a grown man. If someone doesn't agree with you, you get upset. You blame everybody. That's immaturity. But it affects you spiritually. <clears throat> you ever acted like that before? And then if you're materially and spiritually immature and you get married, then it becomes battle of Kurukshetra. For sure. You agree? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so going back to the point, the men are not going to preach that women are less. And if the men do preach that, the women aren't going to believe it, because if you believe it, then you're going to act it out. But you're not going to fight. You're going to accept your differences. There are differences, right? There are definite differences. But does that mean one's superior, one's inferior? Now. A man likes to be in a superior position. That's his ego. That's how his ego is. And a woman understands that. So as long as he's qualified, she can go along with it. Because she naturally would rather go along with it. She doesn't want to fight. She doesn't want to fight for her rights. She'd rather him provide her with her rights. And then he encourages her. And every situation is different. So if you're trying to apply a Vedic paradigm to every situation, you have to adjust it. Right? Is that okay?
And if you don't adjust it, you might get, uh, get in trouble. You know the saying? You put a square peg in a round hole. Well, sometimes we do that. Is that all right? Is that okay? Maybe? Think about it. How about this idea? You're not a man and she's not a woman. That kind of solves the whole problem. <laughs> the male ego wants to feel that he's right. Yes? The male ego wants to be served. The male ego wants to control. All very bad things for getting out of the material world. Right? The female ego wants to serve. The female ego naturally is happy being subordinate. All good things for getting out of the material world. Yes? So women have advantages in some ways over men. Men have advantages in some ways over women. And if the men make, feel, make the women feel that they all have disadvantages, then they won't try as hard. They'll make excuses because I'm a woman, therefore I'm not Krishna conscious, or I can't succeed at this or that. And then you turn on the television and watch a woman preacher preaching to 20,000 people, or a teenage Indian girl on television speaking Bhagavad Gita to like 10,000 people. That changes the picture. You know that girl? That little girl? What's her name? She was doing Bhagavad Gita when she was like 11 or something, right? On television. It's amazing. Uh, how does it work the other way around when a woman says to a man that, you know, you can do it, you will do it? Oh, yeah. Or vice versa, like that you can't do it. You oh, yeah. Oh, how does it work with a man? It works the same way. That's a good point. If a woman tells a man, puts him down, it'll have the same effect on him. And if a woman tells a man, you can do this, go for it if you're married, yeah, it works very positively on him. So every time you tell anybody something bad about them, you're degrading their self-conception and that you're minimizing their ability. Whether you know it or not, that's what's happening. You stupid idiot, I can't believe you're so stupid that you would do such a stupid thing. What have I just done? I pretty much ensured that he's going to continue doing stupid things because I've convinced him he's stupid. Right? Instead I say, you're so smart, let's figure out what to do now. We, you made a mistake, but well, you're smart enough to, to repair this and move forward, so let's figure it out. And then he gets confidence. Okay, I can figure this out. And he figures it out, and he feels good. That's the way Prabhupada did it. Okay, you made a mistake, so what's next? What do we do now? That's all. Okay, you're a sannyasi, you fell down. Okay, get married. What service do you want to do? End of story. Wow, amazing, huh? Not like, how could you do this to me? What's wrong with you? You gave up your sannyas. You made a vow. You broke it. You're an animal. You're useless. Never did that. And he never wanted anyone to do that. Okay, go forward. What's next? So one time they asked Prabhupada, they said, Prabhupada, are women, a woman asked Prabhupada, are women less intelligent? Yeah, and he said, if you think you're a woman, you're less intelligent. That was his answer. So I think we could tell the same. If someone says you're less intelligent, you have to understand what that means. It's not that means you're, un, you're not capable. It means, look at your body. By nature, your body is designed to be homebound. Isn't it? 
That's the body you have. The male body is not designed to be homebound. The male impregnates and goes away, and the woman has the baby. She's homebound now, right? It's a different. So that's just natural. The men have all the fun and the women have to do the austerity. Yes? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. All right. So seniors chastised juniors because sometimes Prabhupada chastised juniors. And sometimes he didn't. So Prabhupada knew when to chastise, when it would get a result. And he knew that if he chastised in some situations, he wouldn't get a result, so he wouldn't do it. So it's not arbitrary. You have to use your discretion. In some cases, chastising is exactly what a person needs. And in some cases, it's exactly what they don't need. It's the worst thing. Uh, yeah, does that make sense? So, does it, wor does it work for Krishna consciousness? Like, okay, I did the right thing. You, you needed to be chastised because you did the wrong thing. And now you leave Krishna consciousness. Whose fault is that? Mostly my fault. Some your fault maybe, but mostly my fault. And if I would have dealt with you properly, you'd still be here, engaged in service. You know, there was a... I was giving a class somewhere, and someone said, did the students learn the lessons? And I said, well, I taught the lessons. He said, that doesn't mean anything. What, what, it really, what really counts is, did they learn it? Because if they didn't learn it, even though you taught it, you're a bad teacher. Right? No, I taught all the lessons perfectly, and no one learned them. That means you didn't teach the lessons. It means you're a bad teacher. Right? So I gave you the perfect advice, and you left Krishna consciousness. So whose fault is that? Well, no, it's not my fault. I gave him perfect advice. And he left Krishna consciousness. That's my fault. Now, if it helps you, then that's good. He did the right thing. But we saw with Prabhupada, some people got chastised heavily and some didn't. And he also knew who could take it and who needed it. Very rare did he chastise women. Very rarely. A woman would have to do something really bad for him to chastise. Really bad. What? Well, one woman painted the deities and the paint didn't dry. She painted with some paint and didn't. Painted the whole deity. And then, she's going to install the deities, then she got some turpentine and took it off, you know, Prabhupada, so upset. Because that's Krishna, putting turpentine on Krishna. You know turpentine? Paint remover? Yeah, doing something, you know, to really wrong to the deities. Yeah. If you want to get chastised by Prabhupada, preach Mayavad philosophy. Yeah, he'll chastise you. For sure. Yeah. Okay, anything else? Question? Yes? Is there a question regarding the young family? Young family. And they're like young boys and young devotees, and boys become quite fanatic, and they just still have a baby, small baby. And he starts to preach to his wife, you're in Maya, you, you're like, there's so much time with your baby, and she has to breastfeed me, and all yeah. the time going with the baby. And now he's like giving her a really hard time, and right. I'm trying to help somehow, but she's not listening. Yeah, yeah. 
she's not your daughter and it's my <laughs> she's saying there's a it's a new couple in Krishna consciousness and the husband's become fanatical so he's chastising his wife because she's attached to the baby and she's spending so much time with the baby and saying you know you're not the body that's not really your child it's, or whatever else you know this is child born by itself he didn't do anything <laughs> The baby is one month old, okay, so um, this um, exemplifies a problem of not understanding the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. You know, it's like you're sick, you're lying on the ground, oh, oh, and I walk by and kick you, you're not the body, you know, get over it, right? Something like that. It's actually happened, you know, in the early days of ISKCON and our fanaticism, things like that would happen. So, and then she's saying that he doesn't listen, doesn't want to listen. That's another qualification of the man, they don't want to listen. Have you noticed that? Yeah. The male ego, see, the reason, if you don't know why men don't want to listen, it's because if they listen, someone's going to tell them what they're doing is wrong. And that, their ego is so big, it gets bruised, so they don't want to listen. That's the problem with the male ego. You agree? Sort of? Especially you know, they don't want to listen to a woman tell them they're wrong. How many of you guys want to listen to a woman tell you you're wrong? Raise your hand, we'll line you up, and they can tell you what's wrong with you. I don't think we'll have a big line here. So, in situations like this, you have to find someone that he respects who can talk to him to explain what's the problem. That's very important. It's unfortunate. I think also... It's a failure to have, have um, that we don't have proper training in place, that someone would think that way. But when you read the philosophy, the philosophy says, surrender everything to Krishna, right? So you can understand why someone might think like that. That's called spiritual immaturity and material immaturity. And one often affects the other. Right? Report him to the GBC. Yeah. The, problem, the problem with these things is people suffer while he's growing up. Yeah. Anything else? You want to stand up? Because we can read a little bit about Baba. That was our next class. We just went a little longer. Um, and we had some... Oh. Um, oh, yeah. We didn't answer the question of the... We got, we got diverted. Um, Our subject was what you're supposed to change and what... Or what you can do. Um, what a woman can and cannot do. Um, there's a story early in the movement Prabhupada was thinking that um, Jamuna would become the GBC so they had no female GBC and then he thought about it and then he decided against it And then his secretary, about a year ago, had discussed this on Facebook. And he said that he decided against it, not because he thought she wasn't qualified, but because the other men wouldn't accept it. So it was a social interaction that was not acceptable, not a lack of material qualification. So what 
what women can't do is sometimes in certain social situations they have limitations because their their position or their actions in certain situations may not be acceptable to men. It doesn't always mean the men are right. It just means that's the reality. You have experience, right? So you have to adjust to that sometimes. So in theory, women can do everything that men can do. But socially speaking, there are adjustments. Like now in India, we don't have women pujaris because it's thought it's not socially acceptable. Although when Prabhupada was here, we had women pujaris in India. So, spiritually it's acceptable, but socially now it's not considered acceptable. Maybe that'll change in the future. So those are the limitations. You know, Well, okay, so she's saying a Prabhupada could order, but a lot of times Prabhupada didn't order things that he knew we couldn't do. And sometimes he would wait for us to mature before he would ask us to do it or before he would see that we were, we were doing it. For example, when I joined ISKCON, male, f if this were a class, it would all be mixed. It wouldn't be left side and right side. If we had a kirtan, it'd all be mixed. There was no men's side, woman's side. It was just man, woman, man, woman. Because that's the culture we came from. If you look at the old videos, you'll see that. Maybe pre-72, you'll see. And you can see in those videos, if you look at the faces of devotees, you can see nobody's thinking there's anything wrong with it. It's just they're dancing for the deities next to a woman. And you can see it's not like anybody's thinking we're doing something wrong or they're enjoying dancing next to a woman. That's just what they did. And Prabhupada, obviously, we had men living in ashrams, women living in ashrams, but he didn't do any of that kind of separation. In fact, if you look at early pictures of Prabhupada, he's surrounded by women. You'll see pictures and there's all women around him. Isn't that interesting? It's like a picture and then right next to him there's all these women. But after 72 or 73, you won't see any pictures like that. And you won't see any kirtans with men and women together. You'll see it separate. So naturally the question is, what happened? You want to know what happened? Yes. Prabhupada did not institute the change. The change was instituted by the devotees. They went to India, they saw the culture, then they understood, oh, this is the culture we represent. This would be better. He said, so Prabhupada, should we have the men on one side, the women on the other? He said, yes, that would be better. So when we came to that realization, when we could do it, then he said, yes, do it. But he wasn't forcing it on us. Do you know why we wear dhotis and kurtas? Do you know why? Because at one point the devotee said, Prabhupada, can we wear them? He never asked anyone to wear them. He said, can we wear them? And their conversations, when they talk about dress, where Prabhupada says, I never asked you to put on dhoti and korta. You asked me if I could wear it. So that was Prabhupada's mood. I'll give you another example. Uh, Prabhupada asked us to distribute books from very early. But nobody really knew how to do it. No one figured it out. Then around 1972, 1973, devotees started figuring it out. And they were distributing lots of books. And then by 1974, 75, 76, it was amazingly fantastic book distribution. And if you want to do a study, you don't have to because I could explain what you would find if you did a study, you would find 
the number of letters about book distribution increasing in those years that devotees were distributing more books. Because what was Prabhupada doing? He was responding to them. They were doing more books, so he was responding. He was pushing, but nothing was happening much. But when it was happening, then he was pushing more. So he was reciprocating. So there were a lot of things that were going on that were being initiated by devotees and then Prabhupada reciprocating. Things that he couldn't make happen until we were ready for them to happen. Did you know that? Yeah. Not everything, but some things. So then things started changing. Women, men separating. And he said, yes, that's good. That's how it should be. So then there became more separation. So as women, now you can't just go in the temple and just join in with the men. In 1970, you could. Nobody would say anything. Nobody would even think to say anything because nobody would think it's wrong. Then devotees come to India. They see the separation. In Bhakti Siddhanta's time, if this were Bhakti Siddhanta's time, there would be a curtain right here. And we wouldn't see any of the women. What if I brought out a curtain today? What do you think? <laughs> that would be weird, wouldn't it? I say, well, that's the proper way. Maybe if I would have said to Prabhupada, we should have a curtain. I don't think he would have agreed. But some things he agreed to. <coughs> Only when we were ready. And if we weren't ready... Some things he didn't push. Does that mean that he didn't ask the moon to become GBC because males will not accept or we are not ready as a society? Yeah, that's my understanding. That the, the men weren't ready for that. They, didn't, they wouldn't appreciate it. Just like, let's say, you're very capable to run a temple and the temple has a temple president and things aren't going well, and you could do it, but if the men didn't feel comfortable, then it wouldn't work, even though you're qualified. Right? They might say, you're too young. When you're 60, you can do it. That'll work better. So those are some of the limitations. The obvious limitation is the men get to give class most of the time, right? But if you want it, so what can you do? Organize your own classes. Rabindra Srup Prabhu made a really nice point. He said, one of the ways I learn the philosophy is by teaching it. And I always get to teach. So I have to study in order to teach. He said, and we've deprived our women of, that, of the thing that helps me the most. He said, that helps me the most in Krishna consciousness. And we basically deprive women of that opportunity of the very thing that helps me the most. So you may be in a temple, they don't want women to give class, but you may organize amongst women to give class because you feel the need to do that. So those are some of the limitations. But really, if you look at all the services, you could really do everything. It's just socially you may have to adjust. You could be a temple president of your own temple that you start, but maybe not the one you live in right now. Yes? Why? They only want women to give class because, I mean men to give class because. They don't accept men. They feel that this is strange to teach women or teach class. Oh, yeah. <coughs> I have a question. How many of you had women teachers? Raise your hand. Women teachers? When you went to school, how many had women teachers? Did you think it was strange that a woman was teaching? Raise your hand if you thought it was strange. Now you become a Hare Krishna. Raise your hand if you think it's women, strange for women to give class. Yeah, you don't want to raise your hand. but oh. Can I comment? There is a tendency, I mean, there is a tendency in men to speak from an emotional platform. Outlet for their 
Is it? Lack of support. Well, the couple that I support okay. has been more like a social counseling meeting. Right, so let's ask her the question. Yeah. Why? why let's, let's ask her why. I've never heard that argument. The main argument I've always heard is, you know, young men don't want to sit and look at a woman give class. But most of the women who give class are old enough to be their grandmothers. So, um, okay, that's a good one. We don't want women to give class because life is short. And we'd be wasting time. <laughs> that's a new one. Because the class isn't going to be very good. <laughs> um. But on the other hand, Omila Matadi, Malefic, you know, they're a such qualified Vaishnavi. Yeah, they yeah. give the most far out yeah, seminars yeah. and classes. So Prabhupada's, and so, you know, Prabhupada's point when he was asked this question, he just said, who's ever qualified, give the class. Yeah. So the point is, that in certain situations, you may be the most qualified to give the class, but socially, it's not going to go over well, that nobody's going to come if you give it because they're against it, so you just don't do it. Or you could protest and do it. But so those are your limitations. So you might choose to do it for women. Ladies first or men first? <laughs> She's really well trained. She's going to let you go first. <laughs> we have a question here. This is even more... Can I take this question first? Because I'm not seeing all these questions. God, I, uh, I'm sorry, everyone out there, that I don't see all your questions. Because they're not coming up properly. He's. Let me just answer this. Um... <clears throat> How do we introduce these topics to senior devotees who are convinced otherwise? Anyone want to answer that question? Can you repeat, please? There's issues. How do we discuss these issues with leaders who don't want to listen? There's an easy answer. The easiest answer is don't. <laughs> if that answer doesn't satisfy you, it's the same answer. You find a leader who's sympathetic who can present it to other leaders. What else can you do? But I can tell you this much, if you wait long enough, you, you, you'll have leaders that will see things differently. Or the same leader will see things differently. And you had your, his question. What was his question? Uh, 
was a story when one lady came to a temple room with wearing her shoes. And oh, okay. one devotee just asked her and she ran away. So Prabhupada said, instead of her, you have to um, invite 100 more. <laughs> Even if you invite 100 more, they, <coughs> the Krishna will not forgive you this time. Oh. Well, one thing I can say is if we, if we ever did anything to um, <coughs> drive anybody away, Prabhupada was very upset. That's for sure. Tap on my, I'm not taking sannyas. I just have an orange shirt. Devotee thought I was taking sannyas. At least I'm not, if I am, I'm not aware of it. Nobody told me. Yes, you? Why do many of them not want to be? Why do they want to be? I only know one that wants to be. You know more than one? Really? Who? You want to be Guru? Yeah. Alright. Um, I think the main reason is because at one point Prabhupada said he wanted all his disciples to be Guru. And he said boys and girls. So that would give them the understanding that, that he wanted them to do that. And, and the, in other words, when you say someone wants to be a guru, in one sense nobody wants to be a guru. They just want to help people become Krishna conscious. So if you think you can help people become Krishna conscious by being guru, then you'll do that. So of course I can't speak for everybody, but that's why you'd want to become a guru because you think you can help people. Or an obvious reason why you want to become Guru is because people are asking you to become their Guru. Yes? And, there, and there's nowhere where Prabhupada said women can't. So you don't, have any, you don't have anything directly from Prabhupada saying you can't do it. So that's why a woman would think I should do it because people are asking and Prabhupada said, I want all my disciples to be Guru, and I never heard him say not to. But we don't have to worry about it. The GVC will figure it all out. But that's, I, I don't think we can answer that question by saying, why a woman? We just have to answer the question, why would anybody? Because there's nowhere where Prabhupada said, women can't do it. If it's clear he said, women can't do it, then we could ask that question, why would they think they can do it? Because he, but... Yeah. Yeah, but then, but then you could ask that question, why would any man want to be a girl? And the answer is, they wouldn't, unless their guru tells them to. That's the answer. Why would you want to do anything? Only because your guru tells you. And, you're, and, the, and their guru told them. It's right there. He said it. And he never retracted that statement. So what are they supposed to think? Yeah. 
No, they're no, they're women also. Yeah, and there's only one in Iskon that I know of that's applied to be guru. So it's so so. Prabhupada said, yeah, there there are a few, and there's always exceptions. But we can only give a general answer, not a philosophical. That someone wants to be guru, it's because their guru asked them. And that's the only reason. Otherwise, if they want to become guru for any other reason, they're going to be in trouble. Why do you want to become guru? Because I need money and followers and prestige. That's why. It's the only reason. Good reason? You want to be my disciple now? Give me some money. Give me your checkbook. Formality? Formality? Yeah, yeah. But the relationship of guru disciple is transference from the heart. So ultimately, you know, whoever, it's like, just like we have so many picture gurus um, that help us in our spiritual life, I have full faith just from my own experience that it's a relationship of the heart and not based on not based on. Not based on experience. Yeah. You know, that's, it's like, it, in my understanding, there's three levels of diksha. One, is direct from the heart. Second level, I give you a garland. Third level, formal, from Shastra. Okay. You know, but, I mean, so how does it relate, how does it relate to her question? Well, because, if it's, a mind situation that's making the choice, then the, You're talking about the guru making the choice or the disciple? Either. I want you as my, you know, if it's from the mind yeah. and not from the heart. Right, so, so, when, when someone becomes a guru, it's an inspiration to serve. That's where it comes from. Now, here's the danger. You become a six-year guru. You're an amazing preacher. You're all over the world preaching. People love your preaching. What do you think is going to happen at a certain point? Someone's going to say, will you give me initiation? Then you have to make a decision. Do you want to do that or not? You feel that's what your guru wants you to do? You feel qualified? You feel it's the right thing? Not because you want to. And you might say, and many others might say, well, if you're a woman, you shouldn't. But many will say, you should. Because you have to get that statement where Prabhupada said, you should not, if you're a woman. He said, you should not take sannyas. We have that statement. That's clear. If you're a woman, you should not take sannyas. What? You meant sannyas? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah you shouldn't take sannyas. Oh, you know women who want to take sannyas. Yeah. Generally, no. But anyway, he said that. Yeah. Uh -huh. But they're wearing white. Yeah. They don't carry a danda. Yeah. I don't know about chaitra sannyas for women. I don't know. So, you may want to do many things, but you have to make sure your spiritual master is okay with that. Otherwise, you don't do it. Is that all right? <coughs> Are you all tired and hungry and bored? You want to stop? Well, you have a question.
just want to understand socially or culturally within within the iscon so we we do not see but if we see outside the iscon even in india even in our own sampradaya we can take the example of janva mata ginga mata goswami there are many others and then outside iscon within the india, within india there are so many ladies female gurus and people are accepting them also they have thousands of disciples but we do not see within our own society so what kind of social or a cultural thing it is that we are following or no what's the social order that that's causing us not to have gurus at this point Well, after this meeting maybe we will have. They might be talking about it right now. So, my instruction may be you know, or this topic may not be relevant. Um There was a feeling that if we want to establish Varnashram, then in establishing Varnashram, you want to establish the place of women and men. in a traditional culture and traditionally the woman would stay at home so for a woman to be diksha guru it violates the principles of varnashram that's the basic argument and it sets a bad example because now they're big public figures and leaders and and they're meant to be leaders of the family that's the idea the opposing idea is that we're a preaching movement and anyone who receives diksha from prabhupad who is following is qualified to give because the diksha guru is giving a mantra and the qualification give the mantra is you got the mantra and you can give it and no one's stopping women from being diksha gurus which is more important than diksha so the, these are the basic arguments And then the argument on the Varnashram side is well all the things Prabhupada did were initial things but now we want to create a community and society so we want to establish social principles which we couldn't establish when we were starting And it seems like the way it's gone's evolving probably it could it could evolve to the point where in some places they'll allow women to initiate and in some places they won't it's possible at this in this country or this city or this temple there's a woman guru and you know say okay mata ji you want to initiate go start a temple and you can initiate people there did that might start like that i don't know we're just a young movement so we're evolving so the main thing is to be careful of the essence of prophetic teachings and to not to be mainstream yeah yeah well both arguments are using his philosophy <laughs> that's the problem that is so uh yeah that's the problem Oh, not legislating. Yeah, that's another. It's another argument. If you say this person can't be a guru, but you want that person to be a guru and they're qualified, then legislation is getting bureaucracy is getting in the way. Yeah, 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 right. Okay, so we're happy. Or are we just tired and sweaty? I don't know if we're happy, but we're tired. One, two, three. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'd give it to him but I don't know if he appreciate it. Yeah, but then,
If anyone has prasadam, you can feed him. Well, that was two hours. I don't even know if we answered all your questions, what they can and can't do. The answer is it depends where, it depends where you live, what women can and can't do. Right? Don't want to leave? <laughs> what else? He's going to ask about bad husbands. Oh, okay. in a position to give advice for those she is not asking for. So what she has to do? She is quite humble and she doesn't want to fight with them or something. But she has her own reason how to do her service. Her, her class, her, you know, her activity. And some male just want to restrict, give some advice, to restrict her. Or, what should she do? What should she do? She doesn't want to fight with them. It's a hard question to ask because I don't know the situation. What do you think she should do? <laughs> what do you think anyone should do? Listen, consider, get back to the person. I consider what you said and I agree with this, I don't agree with that. What do you think? What just happened? What did you say? I translated the question to them. Mahatma Prabhu said that she should be able to do what she wants and think about what she wants. All right, we finish now. Thank you. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai, Go Premanandi, Hari Hari Bo.